Well, happy Monday, everyone. Uh, favorite day of the week for me because of the trivia a game we were able to bring you almost every week. I know we didn't bring it to you last week, so apologies for that. Had a little bit of technical difficulties. We've fixed that, and here we are back uh, on Monday for Monday Fun Day Trivia. Uh, today, our presenter is none other than Peter Marks, Master of Wine. Let me bring uh, Peter up uh, on screen. Hey, Peter, how are you? I'm good, Christian. How are you? Doing great, doing great. I think uh, I think we, whoops, we just lost our, 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 our overlay, so... Um, th things are things are going great. What what topic do you have for us today? Well, as you know, Christian, we live here in Napa, and we're going through a heat wave. So, I thought I'd go where the weather might be a little cooler since it's winter time into the southern hemisphere. We'd go. All so right. this will test everybody's knowledge a little bit. I know a lot of people who've been watching some of our Monday Fun Day trivia's have been focused a lot on the northern hemisphere, but today we are going to be looking at South America, Africa, and uh, New Zealand, Australia. Great. Well, you know, we have a lot of uh, wine geeks, smarty, smarty I pants know. out there. Hopefully you have some really challenging questions for them. I did try to step it up a little bit today. So, But yeah. I, I know you're absolutely correct. We do have some real wine geniuses out there, and I won't be surprised if somebody gets them all right. Great, great. Well, without further ado, let me, let me bring up the screen with, uh, with the questions and take it away. Okay, thank you. And hello, everyone. Looks like we've got people from all over, and nice of you to join us today. So here we are. We're going to start off with our first question on the Southern Hemisphere, which is, which is Argentina's southernmost wine-producing region? Is it Cafayete, La Rioja, Mendoza, or Patagonia? Which is the most southern wine-producing region in Argentina? And as always, we have our Jeopardy music playing as your thinking about this, go ahead and put it in the comment section, your answers into the comment section. Um, and those who get it right get bragging rights. Yeah. I see a couple answers coming in. Let me know when I should post the correct one. Okay, yeah, so we have uh, quite a few in, a couple more coming. The overwhelming uh, consensus here seems to be D, Patagonia. Excellent, excellent. D is correct. Yeah, well, here we are in the southern tip of the southern uh, South America and also of Argentina. And we're actually, you know, this region, which is typified by the Rio Negro and also Nequin, is about, um, it's about 30 nine degrees south so it's not necessarily that far south in the uh, overall growing regions i mean there's some areas that are further south as we'll see later today but um, this area is quite different from the other areas that tend to be more influenced by the andes you know here we find that uh, it's actually in a valley that kind of runs east to west um, and there's a river that flows through it that uh, runs out into the atlantic to the to the east but the that the climate here is a little bit more humid and also higher rainfall. And you don't find quite the altitude that you do find up in the Mendoza region. But it is becoming a little bit more known for grapes, although in the past it's always been traditionally growing fruit trees and fruit crops uh, of many types. But again, wine grapes are coming into uh, vogue now as well. All right, so we're off to a good start. And now we'll talk about what percent of Argentina's vineyards are planted to the famous Malbec grape. Is it 11 percent, 16 percent, 22 or 28 percent? So Malbec. I think I've had a couple of Malbecs in the last couple of months just trying a few to keep me interested. There's always something new when I go to my local wine shop to keep me interested. And I must say the, the Malbecs have gotten so much better over the years. And, there's some very serious producers that are making some great examples. Great, so we still got a little time here. Jeopardy music still playing. Yeah. Peter Trebek, There's, your host. Yeah, <laughs> and as you know, Malbec is the famous grape that you find in uh, parts of France in the Cahors region. Although um, most of the Malbec in the world today is found in Argentina. Okay, so we have people answering C, D, um, you know, pretty pretty evenly. Yeah. So okay, good. Well, some of you are correct. It is indeed C, twenty-two percent of all the 
total vineyards. And if you talk about just the red grapes, uh, Malbec makes up almost 39% of all red varieties. So it is indeed the dominant variety in Argentina. By the way, the second most prominent variety is Bar Bernarda. Bernarda comes in second. It has about 9% uh, of all the grapes grown in the country. And some of you may know Bernarda. Uh, here in California, we call it the Charbono grape, which is a, a grape that makes really dark red, uh, intense flavored wine with some really intense color and pretty good tannins as well. But they call it Bernarda in Argentina. Good. So for those of you who got that right, let's switch it over and talk about some white grapes. What is the most planted white grape variety in Argentina? Is it Chardonnay? Is it Sauvignon Blanc? Is it Torrantes or Viognier? Nice. We've got some very flavorful grapes down there. And those of you who know Sauvignon Blanc and Torrantes and Viognier, those are fairly aromatic varieties, where Chardonnay is a little bit more neutral, but all of these grapes um, have a place in Argentina. But which is the most widely planted? Okay, this is coming in here. Okay, so the music has stopped. It and looks like a lot. Yeah, what, what I, are you seeing? I see a lot of C's. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, okay. a lot of C's. And C for correct. You are absolutely right. You guys are good. So Torrantes is the most prominent white variety, as you can see here, making up about 27%. Oh, that should be all 27% of all white varieties. Sorry, I just realized I got a little mistake on the slide. Um, and it is definitely of all the um, grapes in the whole country, it makes up about 5%. By the way, this grape, as you know, is a very aromatic variety. To me, it always reminded me of when my grandmother, I used to, when I was a kid, I'd go to my grandmother's house and I'd go into her bathroom and it always smelled like bath powder. And to me, that's kind of what Toronto smells like. It's a, actually a cross between Muscat of Alexandria and the Mission grape. Um, and it's not as uh, fruity as the true Muscat grape that we typically have, which can be like a summer fruit of you know, peaches and nectarines and uh, some floral character. This has, Torrentes to me has a more of a floral and somewhat of a soapy aroma to it, which is kind of unique. All right, so now we're gonna go uh, maybe step it up a little bit in the questions here and, and as far as the difficulty. So here's a question about the vineyard with the highest altitude in Argentina. So the question is high, high, how high is the highest vineyard in Argentina? Is it 7,604 feet? 8,010 feet, 9,577 feet, or is it 10,922 feet? So which is that correct, the altitude? No matter what, you gotta admit that is like really high. <laughs> Anything over 7,000 feet is like, whoa, oxygen, I need oxygen. I just got lightheaded when you were reading off those numbers. Uh, yeah, yeah. See answers coming in from all over the place, Christian. Yeah, got an international a lot of bees, project. Though. Yeah, a lot, a lot of, bees. of bees. We'll see coming in there. Deborah with a C. Okay. All right, we're ready to reveal. Yeah, let's do the big reveal. Okay, believe it or not, it's ten thousand nine hundred and twenty-two feet. I mean, gosh, who could who could survive up there? Well. This is owned by Claudio Zucchino, who has a vineyard up there um, that grows organic Malbec, Syrah, and Merlot. And to me, organic seems like like pretty simple way to grow grapes when there's nothing up there that would survive anyway, right? Um, and also, there's another vineyard that, that's pretty close to this, not quite as high, but um, some of you know uh, Donald Hess, uh, makes Hess Collection wines here in Napa Valley. He has a winery down in Argentina, and they have a vineyard which uh, tops out at 10,027 feet. By the way, um, neither of these are the highest vineyards in the world. Um, I recently read an article that talked about the highest vineyard in the world is actually somewhere in Tibet at 11,690 feet. But, you know, what's, a, what's another, you know, 700 feet or more? It's, <laughs> they're all pretty tall. By the way, the workers up here, um, when they first go up there, they have to eat the leaves of the cacao plant because it helps them 
with a lack of oxygen so they can do do some work. But uh, probably um, you probably need to pay not by the hour up there, but maybe by the task because it takes quite a long time to do the farming. All right, so let's go on to another country. So Uruguay, which is known for a signature variety itself. Is that Albarino, is it Chardonnay, Merlot, or Tanat? And you can see a beautiful picture there of some of the vineyards from uh, Uruguay, which is becoming really well known for their wines. I recently had a Sauvignon Blanc, which um, I was just blown away with. It was so good, so good. See the answers coming in here. Oh, yes, I misspoke. Uh, yep, that's. Are we ready to reveal yet? Yes, we are. Okay. And the answer here, I think a lot of you got this correct, is Tanat. So this is the red grape known for extensive color and rich tannins. It was actually brought to Uruguay with. Um, settlers from the Basque country. And today, Tanat accounts for about 25% of all plantings in the country. So it makes a significant amount of the wine here. But again, there's other varieties that are mentioned like Albarino, Chardonnay, Merlot, and Sauvignon Blanc that are also doing quite well. All right, so let's go to a different country down in South America and all over to Chile. And which of the Chilean wine regions has a cool climate suitable for Pinot Noir. Which is that? Is it Colchagua, Curaco, Maipo, or San Antonio? And I'm not talking about San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> I was talking to my father who lives in Arizona yesterday, and you know, I tell him it was 104 here in Napa, and he said, oh, we're 81 in Tucson. I'm going, something's wrong with this picture. Yeah, it was, I, I saw the temperature gauge from Death Valley, about 130 degrees, I think, all-time record in Death Valley. Yeah. Okay. We got, uh, all right, we got them all over the place, so. Yeah, okay. So the answer here happens to be San Antonio. Now, if you look on that map, some of these other regions, such as Colchagua, Curaco, Maipo, are further south than San Antonio, but San Antonio is right on the coast. So it's affected by those cold Humboldt currents that come from the south from Antarctica. Um, and that keeps it very cool. Just like here in the northern part of California, we have the cold currents that come off the uh, from Alaska and brings in that cool air and fog. So the proximity to the ocean is what makes San Antonio a cool climate, very suitable for Pinot Noir. And there's been some really excellent examples that I've had uh, in, in recent uh, years that are coming from this area. Okay, so let's go on to our next question about Chile and which grape variety was planted early on in Chile by Spanish colonists? Was it Carignan, Carmenher, Merlot, or Pais? Which of those grape varieties? By the way, they're all red. So obviously they brought some red grapes with them and which one was the one that helped get the vineyard started in Chile? Mixture of answers coming in again. Yeah. Yeah. Got some good answers coming in. I'm impressed with everyone's answers so far. Been pretty good. Okay. So we have a kind of a combination between B and D, it looks like. And D it is. So this is the old Pais grape, which is actually the historic name for this grape in Chile. It's also known as uh, Criola Chica. I like saying that Criola Chica just rolls off the tongue and also known as the mission grape here in California. So this is a grape that was planted um, also by the church when they began to plant grapes and, and build the um, missions in California. They planted this grape as well. So you can see a picture of an old vineyard there, which is still existing today. So some people are starting to revive this variety and make some very good wines, uh, very high quality wines, although it's not reputed to have the uh, reputation of being able to make good quality wines. But there's some good examples coming now from Chile. Alrighty, so on to our next question. 
Los Vascos, which is a winery in Chile, is owned by which famous producer? Is it Chateau Lafitte Rothschild? Is it Kendall Jackson? Is it Miguel Torres? Or is it Robert Mondavi Winery? So which of those four producers own Los Vascos? And you can see a picture of the beautiful Shea or wine cellar, as they call it there in the picture, which uh, and they do make some delicious wines at Los Fosco at all price ranges, which you can find some really good affordable ones for about $12 a bottle. And, um, you know, two or three times that they make some exceptional wines that can ri rival some of the best in the world. Okay, so we have answers coming in, C's and D's, uh, a mm -hmm. couple of A's sprinkled in there. Okay, so. great. And the answer is A for awesome. Yes, Chateau Lafitte. You can see on the label there right underneath Los Vascos, Domaine Barons de Lafitte, or de Rothschild Lafitte. So this is owned by the famous Chateau in Bordeaux. I will mention that all of these other uh, answers have or have had uh, affiliations with wineries in Chile. So Kendall Jackson and Miguel Torres still do. Uh, Robert Mondavi used to have a relationship in the uh, in the country, but not anymore. But um, obviously a lot of international interest in Chile, which has helped to really rise the quality uh, of the wines, giving the technical knowledge and expertise that they've helped bring to the country. Okay, so our next question, one more about Chile here. Who or what has yet to arrive and invade Chile? Is it El Nino? Is it the Kardashians? Natural wine? or phylloxera. So which of those has yet to invade Chile? So I'm thinking that uh, some of you might be able to exclude one of these answers, maybe, so you don't have to think too hard. See the answers coming in now. Yeah, I'm really bummed no one has picked B or the Kardashians yet. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> okay. They can go yeah. everywhere, but guess what? Yes, the Kardashians have been to Chile already. <laughs> but what hasn't been there is phylloxera. So even today, there's been no reports of phylloxera invading. Um, and, you know, Chile is well suited for protection from any outside pest, partly because of its location or mostly because of its location. Obviously, it has the Pacific Ocean to the west and to the south. It has the, um, it has the Andes to the east and then the Atacama, Mount, or Atacama Desert to the north. So it's really isolated in that sense. And other places in the world where you have heard that there's a, uh, an absence of phylloxera is actually starting to infiltrate. You know, particularly recently, I've been reading some articles about Washington State, where they've found some phylloxera in Walla Walla. Uh, they always thought they were protected, but perhaps not anymore. Also, similar things are happening in parts of Australia that in the past has not been infested with phylloxera. So today, Chile is still pretty much um, not inhabited by phylloxera, and let's hope it never gets there. Okay, well, we're going to move on to another continent now. We'll move over to the other part of Australasia, down to New Zealand and Australia. So here we are in New Zealand. Which, which of these regions in New Zealand has a continental climate? Is it Canterbury, Central Otago, Martinborough, or Waiheke Island? And that picture that you see there is one of my favorite pictures of New Zealand. It's kind of hard to see the North and South Island there, but if you look carefully under the cloud cover, you will be able to make out some of the landmass there. You know, New Zealand is just basically one beautiful farm. It's all nuclear-free zone. If you're afraid of nuclear power or weapons, you will not find any of those in New Zealand. It's a very green farm. A lot of sustainable and organic practices allow them to make some exquisite wines. Okay, so we have our Good answers question. in. And they seem to be coming in, I uh, see quite a few Bs. That's true, yeah. That's the, that's the best answer for B. 
And indeed, all of these other regions have what is known as a maritime climate. Um, and that's because it is due to its proximity for all the other regions uh, to the ocean, either to the east or to the west. In fact, nowhere in New Zealand will you ever be more than 80 miles from the ocean. So you can see the maritime effect will be very prominent in most of the country. However, in the south, as you can see where we're pointing to, um, not only is it further south and most of the vines in central Otago are around the 45 parallel or so, give or take a little bit. So they're pretty far south where it's cold, but there's also altitude as well. So that is giving you a much more extreme temperature change from summer to winter, which is what defines a continental climate. Whereas maritime, you don't have as much difference in temperatures in between the summer and winter, not as not as wide as you would find in a continental. Okay, good good job, folks. And now the question gets a little tougher, I believe. What is New Zealand's second largest wine region in production? I think you all know what the most largest production area. I'll tell you if you don't, it's Marlborough, home of Sauvignon Blanc and other varieties. But what is the second largest? Is it Central Otago, Gisborne, Hawke's Bay, or Wairapa? So why you wrap up your mind around that? Christian, play the music. And uh, I'll tell you, if you've never been to New Zealand, it's a good time to go. I mean, they've got COVID under control. Uh, although there's been a little spike recently, but for the most part, they've done a great job. And if, if you had to get away, if you could get away, I would probably go there. So questions are coming in. I see some answers coming in and quite yeah. a few C's. Okay, so we review. Yeah, let's Couple do it. And, Okay, so the answer is, indeed, it's Hawke's Bay. So this has uh, an area which is known for red varieties. This is the warmest part of New Zealand where you can actually ripen red grapes properly. Part of that has to do is, as you can see in the map, it's somewhat sheltered there from some of the strong winds and cool ocean breezes that can come up the coast. It also is further north, so it has a, a warmer temperature. But it's still it, you know, it's in the shadow of Marlborough. So Marlborough has more than seventy thousand or about seventy thousand acres of vines, whereas Hawke's Bay only has about twelve thousand. And if you're looking for really excellent Syrah, some of the best Syrahs in the New World, I've had some from Hawke's Bay that are just amazing. Also Cabernet, Cabernet blends are terrific as well, especially from the Gimlets, Gimlet Gravels subregion, which is part of Hawke's Bay. So don't think that New Zealand's just for white wine. It's also making some great reds. All right. So I think you all know that Sauvignon Blanc is the number one most widely planted variety in New Zealand. What is the second most widely planted? Is it Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, Pinot Noir, or Merlot? Which of those varieties? And you can see some of the beautiful vineyards there. You notice how they're netted. Uh, which is a common thing you'll see in New Zealand because there's lots of natural wildlife and the birds will eat those grapes before they get harvested. In fact, uh, I visited there once and there was a netting going on in one vineyard. There were cannons being shot off in another vineyard. There were scarecrows and the, the uh, tinsel little flags in another vineyard. Anything they could do to scare those birds away. But uh, netting is probably the most effective, but obviously more labor intensive and costly than some of the other remedies. Okay, we're a little bit the all answer, over the, the all board over the place. here. So. Okay, good. Well, maybe we're getting a little challenging here. So the answer for this is indeed Pinot Noir. And Pinot Noir is found in mostly the cooler climates as you would expect. So indeed it's found in central Otago. Uh, some of the most amazing Pinot Noirs come from there which can rival some Burgundies in my estimation. And you also find it in Marlboro, which makes a, a much lighter style, but it's quite fragrant and, and pretty. And then you do find Pinot Noir planted also in Canterbury and also in the Wairapa area. Um, part of that Wairapa is the region of uh, Martinboro, which is just outside the capital of Wellington. If you ever visit there, it's a great place to uh, visit very easily uh, access from the airport there in Wellington. All right, so we got another question with New Zealand, and that has to do with which one of these wineries is not located in New Zealand? Is it Craggy Range, Felton Road, Jantz, or Kumeo River? Which of those is not 
in New Zealand. I will mention all of these wineries make fantastic wines. So you might recognize these names for the quality, but only one of those is not actually in New Zealand. And I can see the answers coming in. Some of you are going with C. I see a D. I'm curious, has anybody gotten all these questions correct so far? If yeah. you have, raise your hand. Let's see. <laughs> Wow, we got some smarty pants out there. What's the answer? It, yeah. <laughs> Somebody's definite, but C, 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 C. Well, <laughs> the answer is indeed C. So Jantz is a winery located in uh, Tasmania, which, as you know, is an island, but uh, still part of Australia. In fact, if you're trying to pick a winery that's closest to New Zealand, Jantz would be a good guess because Tasmania is closer than the mainland of Australia to New Zealand. Okay. Very w well done. Let's go to that other nearby country, speaking of Australia. Um, the question here is, which of these Penfolds Australian wines is not a red wine? Is it Bin 707? Is it Grange? Is it McGill Estate? Or is it Yatarna? So which of those wines is not a red wine? And I wish I had a bottle of each one of those wines over there. Someone's calling me for the answer. Yeah, Call someone's finding the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get that one off. Phone a friend if you don't know. All right, are we ready to reveal? Yeah, let's do it. What do we see? We're, we're seeing we're D's answer. across the board here. Yeah, I guess I'm gonna have to make these questions harder next time. It is indeed. Yatarna, which is a Chardonnay wine. Uh, this is a wine that um, was designed to help maybe rival Grange, which is a famous red wine made by Penfolds. And this wine was first launched in 1998, uh, made from the 1995 vintage. And I was a retailer at the time. I remember tasting this wine and I, I was blown away. It didn't taste, it didn't taste like Australian Chardonnay typically tasted at the time. It was beautiful, well-defined, uh, sublime, had some minerality. And that was just, you know, somewhat in between like a maybe a cool climate Chardonnay from California or even something from Burgundy. You know, back in the 80s or, and 90s, you know, most of Australian Chardonnays were these big, ripe butter balls with lots of toasty oak. But this kind of helped define the, the new style of Australian Chardonnays that you do find today, which are more focused and uh, more um, lower alcohol and, and less oak influence. And by the way, it's curious, but, you know, you think about Grange which is a multi-regional wine. Uh, it's not necessarily from uh, one sub-region within Australia. Yatarna is the same. It actually comes primarily from cool climates and primarily from the uh, from uh, Adelaide Hills and from Tasmania. So it's only labeled as Australia on the label. Okay, let's see if you can match these regions correct with its territory. So matching these two are important. So is it A, New South Wales and Clare Valley, or B, South Australia and Rutherford Land, C, Victoria and Yarra Valley, or D, Western Australia and Hunter Valley? So which of those are matched up? Which wine region is matched up with the correct territory? And yeah, this will require some noodling, so. I think so. By the way, I know we just uh, we just recorded a webinar with Mark Davidson, who's the Australian wine expert here for Wines of Australia, and uh, I believe that'll be on our website soon. Is that right, Christian? That is right. Yeah, in the next next week or so, we'll have that that up for viewing. It was a webinar on the styles of Shiraz that you find today, which I think will also change the opinions of many people uh, because there's a wide variety of styles being made, not just the the big high alcohol oak bombs that are traditional in the past. Okay. So what so do we have? For we have a lot. Uh, well, we have A's, some C's, some D's. So okay. Let's Good. see what we got. For those of you who said C, you are correct. So the Yarra Valley, which is just northeast of Melbourne, and uh, this is a very cool climate recognized for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but also starting to find some really uh, excellent Shiraz and Cabernet wines as well. But 
nice thing about the Yarra Valley, it's only about an hour from Melbourne. And, you know, if you want to visit again, it's a great area for tourism since it's just a hop, skip and a jump from the airport in Melbourne. All right, I think I got another question here for Australia. And this one has to do with what is the country's second most widely planted grape variety? Is it Cabernet, Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, or Shiraz? So not the most planted, but the second most planted variety. This one might trip some people up. If not, I'm really gonna have to dig deeper next time. So answers coming in yet, Christian? They are slowly trickling in. Okay, good. Slower, slower answers probably mean a little tougher question. Yeah, good, all right, all right. Okay, so we have- Keep everybody on their toes. Yeah, yeah I see they're all over the board. They are all they? over the board. Okay, well, that's good. Finally tested, made a little bit of a challenge for you. All right, the answer then is, da 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 it is Chardonnay, as you can see here on the map, or on the, on the uh, chart. So this is second after Shiraz, as you can see. Shiraz has the highest. This is based on tonnage from the uh, most recent vintage. And Chardonnay second with Cabernet coming in third, and then uh, and also a close third. So Chardonnay's just beating out Cabernet by a little bit. And then finally Merlot uh, is in fourth place. But uh, Australia does make some fabulous Chardonnays, and obviously Cabernet, Shiraz, they're all, all fine, all delicious wines. Okay, I think we do have one more question here, and then we'll move on to South Africa, but we have one more for Australia, and that is, which of these wine regions is the farthest north in latitude in Australia? Is it Barossa Valley? Is it Kunawara? Is it the Great Southern? Or is it Hunter Valley? So which of those is the most northerly region in Australia? And I'm going to guess a lot of people will get this right. If you, if you know your geography. Slowly trickling in. Trickling in again, okay. So let's give you a couple more seconds here. Yep. Okay. Ready? Yep. Looks like a lot of you said D, and you are darn right. Absolutely. Hunter Valley. This is actually a region that's about 80 miles north of Sydney, and it's quite famous, uh, even though it only makes about 3% of Australia's total production. But uh, if you've never had an Hunter Valley, uh, semi, as they would say, Semillon or Semillon. That is a signature type of wine that they make there. You know, they pick it early. Uh, alcohol will be about 10, 10 and percent. So it's very low in alcohol, dry, searing acidity, and amazingly age worthy. So it develops a lot of that orange marmalade and lanolin character with bottle age. And most people say you don't touch a Hunter Valley Semillon until they're at least 10 years of age. This area, by the way, is very hot and humid, uh, but it is protected by a cloud cr cover, um, which helps to mitigate some of the heat there. But it does get quite warm in this uh, northern climate. Okay, so next we have South Africa. We got a few questions yet to go. And the question here has to do with what, or which grape variety is the most widely planted in South Africa? Is it Cabernet Sauvignon, Chenin Blanc, Pinotage, or Shiraz. Which of those grapes is the most widely planted? And I'll give you a hint. That picture is a picture of that grape variety. So if anybody can recognize grapevines, <laughs> you're a better person than I am because I, I wouldn't be able to tell. I, I can just tell you it's old, like me. But I'm not that old. Not yet. Speaking of my dad, I was tell, telling you about it. He's 99. Can you believe that? That's 99. amazing. Well, you have good genes. Yeah, his father, my grandfather, lived to be 99. So I'm not going to retire anytime soon. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Okay. So I see answers coming in here. 
Looks like a few Shannon blocks. Yeah. Lots of Shannon blocks. And the answer is Shannon block. You guys don't get fooled easily. And, you know, even though this is the number one planted coming in at about uh, 18 and a half percent of all the varieties planted in in the country, um, it is fallen down. It, it, the production of Shannon Blanc has dropped over the years. It used to be over 50 percent and it used to be used extensively for distilling into brandy. But now that South Africa is becoming a much more prominent wine growing area, they are really cutting down on the production of Chenin Blanc and obviously using more uh, international varieties. But they do have some of the best vineyards still planted to Chenin Blanc, as you saw in that old vine that you saw in the previous slide, where a lot of these old vines produce low yields with amazing dimension and character and complexity in the wines. Um, two styles of Chenin Blanc you typically find in South Africa. One is the more easy drinking stainless steel ferment, crisp, crisp and clean, sometimes a little hint of residual sugar to uh, help to balance sometimes that high acidity, but a very easy, pleasant summer type type of you know porch pounder, as I would call it. But then you do have Chenin Blanc made like a Chardonnay with barrel fermentation and maybe malolactic. And I've tasted a lot of those that really confuse me and they taste a lot like Chardonnay. Uh, so you can also see that uh, the, the second most widely planted variety is columbard. So there's still some French columbard planted in South Africa. And then coming in at third is Cabernet Sauvignon. By the way, poor people in South Africa, you know, they've, with COVID, the government has started off with allowing people to buy um, alcohol and buy wine, and then they closed it down. Then they opened it up again, and then they closed it down again. And now they finally opened it up again. So it's just, it's like, it's like a yo-yo down there. I can't get over it. But hopefully they'll keep it open for now. All righty. So this question has to do with when did they start making wine in South Africa? Was it 1659? Was it 1726? Was it 1776? Or was it 1801? And there's a picture of one of the first governors, Governor Jean van Riebeck, who is responsible for helping to make the first wines down there. We'll see how many people get this one right. This one's a little bit of a challenge. Hmm. See answers coming in, Christian? Are they showing oh. a consensus or are they all over? Uh, there, there's a, A seems to have gotten the most, most replies. Yeah, okay. So, Just go for the old estate, huh? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's one. Well, now we have some Bs coming in, so yeah, it's yeah. Not evenly split between A and B. Okay. Well, the A's have it here. It is 1659, and yeah, you know, this is the beginning of wine making excellence in South Africa. So, as you probably know, South Africa was right at the you know, southern tip of South Africa, uh, the continent of South Africa or of Africa, excuse me, and as a result, it was a area where traders would come from uh, from the East Asia and they would take ships through this southern part of um, the continent on their way back to um, Europe. And it became a stopping point for you know refreshment along the way. So this governor, von Riebeck, planted varieties in 1655 and the first wine was made in 1659. And he said, he wrote down today, praise be to God, wine was made for the first time from Cape grapes. And believe it or not, this is the only recorded history that we know the exact date when the wine industry began in a given country. So nobody else has evidence that records a specific year where wine started, except for in South Africa. Alrighty, so we have one last question, another question about dates. When was the first commercial release of a South African Pinotage? Was it 1924, 1945, 1953, or 1961? And actually, if you're looking at Bordeaux, those are all pretty damn good Bordeaux years. So probably a great year for South African Pinotage, I would assume as well. So coming in at this final question, let's get it right. Let's 
Finish strong, everybody. Where are the answers coming from, Christian? So we have so far A, B, D, C, D, B. So they okay. are okay. a little more varied than the last one. Okay. All right. And shall we reveal? Let's do it. Da -da -da. 1961. Now, some of you may have picked 1924. That's actually the year that the grape was crossed. It was a crossing um, that was a crop, you know, crossing of Cinso and Pinot Noir to sort of mimic the qualities of a Pinot Noir grown in a warmish climate. But the first commercial release was not until 1961. As you can see that bottle there, it was a 1959 vintage wine under the label Lanzarick. Lanzarick Winery produced the very first commercial Pinotage. And if you've never had Pinotage, well, do yourself a favor. Go try one. In fact, try it, you'll like it. I always say people just haven't tried a good Pinotage if they haven't liked what they've tasted before. And I will admit, when I first started tasting South African wines and tasting South African Pinotage, there wasn't much to like. I mean, a lot of the Pinotages had that sort of rubbery, smoky quality. In fact, they always used to remind me of a, if you took a rubber chicken and threw it on a barbecue, like you got smoked rubber chicken, that's kind of what they smelled and tasted like. But today, they're never been better. Um, and they are great barbecue wines, as they would use these in uh, South Africa, or they call them brais. So if you have a brai, you want to have a little barbecue, some ribs, some steaks, whatever, maybe a pinotage should be the next item on your grocery list. So there we go. Those are our questions for today. I've all run out of questions. Well, those were great. Thanks so much, Peter. And uh, thanks to all of you who participated. Uh, really smart crowd, not surprised. Uh, we've learned yeah. that from several other trivias that we've run here on Facebook is how uh, smart and, and well-educated all of you are. So congratulations. Uh, you're gonna, you stuck that image in my mind, rubber chicken on a, on a barbecue. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. forever burning well, you, my mind. You've burned rubber before, right? Like, sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe in your high school days and you're patching out in your car, but yeah, it, it wasn't that great in the wine, but it's, they're better, believe me, they're better. So I'm curious, did anybody get all the answers correct? Is there anybody out there willing to say, yeah, I did it? Or anybody got maybe 18 out of 20, because there were 20 questions here. Yeah, I think maybe only there, there, there must be. We, we need to find a, a good way of keeping, keeping uh, track and, and score. Uh, but we do have a lot of okay. thanks out there. Uh, a lot of people had fun, so thanks so much for the, uh, for the comment. And uh, t Peter, before you go, Tell us about um, uh, one of the fun, interesting interviews you have coming up. Yes, so this coming Wednesday, two o'clock uh, Pacific time, uh, we will, or I will be interviewing Lisa Parati Brown, who is the chief editor of Robert Parker and the Wine Advocate. So as you know, Robert Parker's sort of taken a step back from the day-to-day -day duties and Lisa's the gal who's in charge. Uh, she's a fellow master of wine. She's also the winner of the Madame Boulanger award for best uh, tasting of the year that she passed. And um, she's a good friend and she's a local Napa resident. Um, and I'll be asking her a lot of questions. And she said, no holds barred. I can ask anything I want. So right on. Well, that... In fact, anybody out there has a question, you know, how, how does she taste? You know, is he, is the ratings influenced by anything other than what's in the bottle? You know, we can ask those questions. Great, that's gonna be fun. So you'll, you'll definitely not wanna miss that. That's on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time here on Facebook. Um, look for us again next Monday for another uh, Monday Fun Day Wine Trivia uh, episode. Uh, we really appreciate you tuning in. Um, stay safe out there. Uh, drink well. And until Wednesday, um, wishing, you, wishing you a happy week. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.